This episode is sponsored by Keeps. What is going on, everybody? My name is John Solo, and today on Mythology Explained, I'm breaking down the life and legend of one of the most underrated gods in the Greek pantheon. His name is Asclepius. He was the benevolent god of healing and medicine, and the fact that we've been dealing with COVID for two years now shows me that he's not feeling very appreciated lately. So consider this episode a sacrifice to him. It may not be as tasty as the roosters that he's used to getting from ancient Greeks, but the goal here is to raise awareness of his majesty and hopefully get him even more delicious roosters on the line, or possibly a Nintendo Switch. I'm not sure if he has one of those yet, and the OLED model did just come out. The point is that if we appease him, then maybe, just maybe, he'll let us go back to hanging out with our family and friends without having to worry that giving them a hug might just kill him. Okay, that might be a lofty goal for a YouTube video, but I stand by my statement that Asclepius doesn't get anywhere close to the love and appreciation that he deserves. Not only is he the reason that humans have made it this long without being taken out by a brain fungus that makes our hearts fall out of our butts, but he's one of the very few Greco-Roman deities that was born mortal. If you want to hear more about his promotion to God status, then you're going to have to stick around. First though, I've got to give a shout out to our sponsor that Asclepius would no doubt approve of, Keeps. Back in the days of old, when Asclepius himself walked the earth, he discovered a laundry list of treatments and remedies for some of the most destructive ailments known to mankind. But there was one condition that he infamously was never able to conquer, male pattern baldness. And that was frustrating for Asclepius because he knew how many men were affected by it. Even to this day, two out of three men still experience some form of hair loss by the time they're 35. That is where Keeps comes in. They're a subscription service that can help you, your friends, or family members who are currently fighting for the right to keep that hairline stop hair loss before it's too late. Not only do they offer clinically proven treatments to combat the symptoms of hair loss, those treatments are personalized to your needs by a doctor, delivered straight to your door, and typically cost half of what they do at the pharmacy. Not to mention, you don't actually have to go to the doctor's office or pharmacy to get your treatment. It'll be delivered straight to your door, which saves you more time and money. And what's really cool is you'll still have access to a doctor for all of your questions. Every treatment plan comes with a full year of unlimited messaging, so you can hit up your doctor with any questions you might have. Whether you're looking to stop hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just show the hair that you have the love and respect it deserves, Keeps has you covered. So go to keeps.com slash John Solo to get 50% off off your first order. And to be clear, that's 50% off the price, not your hair. That'd be the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish here. So before we dive into these stories about Asclepius, you should probably know a little more about his domain and his role in ancient Greek society. We've covered that he's the god of medicine, but you have to understand how important a title like that is to a civilization that hasn't discovered antibiotics. Now what's really cool about Asclepius is that we actually have a decent amount of information about how he was worshipped, including when that worship started. Apparently it was around 5th century BCE when he replaced his father Apollo as the god of healing. Temples to Asclepius were built all across Greece, and you could basically think of these as ancient hospitals. People would go there to make sacrifices to the god, usually a rooster, but sometimes other sacred objects, and in exchange, they would receive treatment from his priests. They would apply ointments, sew up wounds, amputate growths, and play soothing music. The sick people who went to his temples typically spent one to two nights there and had to follow rules that were laid out by the priests. The belief was that Asclepius, in the form of a serpent, would come to priests and patients in their dreams and reveal his remedies. So, statues to Hypnos and Morpheus, the gods of sleep and dreams, were a common sight at these events. As a matter of fact, so were serpents. Because of their seasonal skin shedding, they were considered a symbol of rejuvenation, and in one myth, they played a pretty important role in Asclepius finding the secret to reviving the dead but more on that later. The point is that if you were at Asclepius' temple, you would see a whole mess of non-threatening yellowish serpents slithering around at your feet, and maybe even over you when you slept. Just imagine if that were still the case at modern hospitals. Maybe then Americans would finally get the free healthcare that we so desperately need. Listen, doc, I would love to pay you, but you've gotta do something about all these snakes. Asclepius may have had numerous temples throughout the country, but his primary place of worship was in Epidauros, the same territory that, according to one myth, is where his mother abandoned him on the side of a mountain. Here, his temple was surrounded with an expansive orchard where no one was allowed to die or give birth. It also held an extravagant statue made of ivory and gold that depicted the bearded Asclepius on a throne with his iconic serpent-encircled staff that's still affiliated with the medical field to this day, even though it's confused with Hermes Caduceus like half the time. 
time. As you can see, Asclepius was prominent and highly praised in ancient times, so it probably won't surprise you to learn that disrespect to the god was not tolerated. After all, the guy had the power to cure humanity of any and all disease. If he were insulted, he would just send a plague to wipe out your city without giving it a second thought. People were so afraid and so superstitious about this that if one were to disrespect one of his sacred objects, like needlessly kill a rooster or chop down an oak tree at a hero's shrine, the people's court would automatically sentence you to death without trying to appease the god's wrath. At least that's what the Roman poet Aelian told us. It may very well have been a rumor or an exaggeration. Regardless, if you wanted to live a long and healthy life in ancient Greece or Rome, your best bet was to pay Asclepius the respect and the roosters that he deserves. As I mentioned earlier though, Asclepius was not always a god. When he came into this world, he was a somewhat mortal man. So let's dive into that very messed up myth and talk about how he was introduced to the healing arts in the first place. Like a lot of other gods we've talked about over the years, Asclepius' birth was pretty horrifying. If I were to rank it, I would say it's somewhere below Zeus sewing the wine god Dionysus into his thigh after accidentally obliterating his mother Semele with his awesome power, and somewhere above Athena leaping out of Zeus's forehead fully formed after Hephaestus sliced him open with an ax. What makes him unique compared to the other gods though is the fact that all the writings we found actually agree about who his parents are. Apollo, the god of sunlight, healing, and archery, and Coronis a beautiful Thessalian princess who Apollo fell in love with at first sight. But while the parentage is always the same, there are two versions of how the relationship leads to Asclepius' birth. In the lesser known one by Pausanias, Apollo gets Coronis pregnant and she has to hide it from her father, the king. Then one day when she's traveling with the king through the aforementioned Epidaurus, she goes into labor and has to sneak away to give birth on the side of a mountain where she abandons baby Asclepius to be raised by a shepherd's dog and a goat. It's a pretty sad origin story, but not the messed up one I was talking about. In that version, which is much more popular, Apollo got Coronis pregnant early on in the relationship and then had to leave town for a while to attend to his godly duties. Coronis truly did love Apollo, but in his absence, she met and caught feelings for a guy named Iscus, and they slept together. What Coronis didn't realize, though, is that Apollo had told a raven living in the area to watch over his beloved. So when that raven saw the shenanigans take place, it flew directly to Olympus and told Apollo all about it. You cheated on me? when I specifically asked you no. not to? No. The god of sunlight was so furious about this betrayal that his angry gaze turned the raven's beautiful white feathers pitch black. And then he took his revenge on his lover. After tracking Coronis down, he called out to get her attention. And when she saw him, she instinctively smiled. And her first thought was, there's my true love and the father of my child, glorious Apollo, the one and only. Meanwhile, Apollo said through eyes filled with tears, since you're such a fan of Shaft, try this one on for size. And at that moment, he took an action he would forever regret and never be able to undo. He loosed a single arrow at Coronis, the woman he loved, and it pierced her directly in the heart. Well, it was either him or his sister Artemis who did the shooting. It depends on which poet you ask. But either way, Apollo felt horrible about it immediately. To make matters worse, Coronis used her dying breath to say that her punishment was deserved and that she still loved Apollo. Talk about being gaslit, am I right? Although he had killed his dear princess in a moment of blind rage, he wanted to honor her with a proper funeral. So he built the pyre, set it ablaze, and gave Coronis' body to the flames. Then... After a while, he remembered his baby was still inside her. So he cut her open, pulled the baby out, named him Asclepius, which appropriately means to cut open, and gave him to the centaur Chiron. Chiron, for those who don't know, is the foster father and trainer of Greece's greatest heroes. He was a master warrior, huntsman, and healer, and it was this last skill that he and Asclepius really focused on. As the boy grew older, his understanding of medicine grew deeper, beyond Chiron's even, and his reputation spread throughout the country, to the point where Greeks were taking treks across deadly terrain and dangerous territories to meet with the great healer and be cured of whatever was ailing them. In the words of the poet Pindar, all then who came to him, some plagues with sword of festering growths, some wounded by the stokes of weapons of bright bronze, of by the slinger's shot of stone, others with limbs ravaged by summer's fiery heat or by the winter's cold. To each for every various ill he made the remedy and gave deliverance from pain. Some with the gently songs of incantations, others he cured with soothing draughts of medicines or wrapped their limbs around with doctored salves, and some he made whole with the surgeon's knife. To put it another way, he was pretty good. Never saw an illness or injury. He couldn't do something to improve. 
Even if he couldn't cure you and death was on the horizon, he'd at least help you alleviate the pain so your last moments here in the mortal realm were blissful ones. Ultimately, he would go on to pull a Darth Plagueis and find a way to bring people back from the dead entirely, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Asclepius went on a number of adventures in his youth and had some pretty interesting patients before being deified. So after graduating from the Chiron School of Medicine and getting some hours in as a floating physician, Asclepius' skill became legendary, and because of that, he was highly sought after by kings and heroes who were building teams to do dangerous tasks where death and injury were more than likely. He was actually one of the Argonauts who sailed alongside Jason on his quest for the Golden Fleece, and he was also part of the group that hunted down the terribly vicious Caledonian boar, known for tearing anyone who came near it to pieces. We don't have any specific details about what Asclepius did on those quests, but the poet Hyginus lists him as a crew member for both, so we can just assume that he played it low-key, stayed away from the action, and just healed the injured warriors and hunters as needed. I'm happy to report, though, there are two other myths where we get to see Asclepius in action, both of which will make you appreciate modern healthcare. In the first one, there's a woman with an intestinal worm that couldn't be cured by even the smartest of doctors, so she went to a temple of Asclepius and prayed for help. Only Asclepius didn't answer her, so she allowed his attendants to try a remedy of their own. They laid the woman down in the same spot that Asclepius would heal his patients, made sure she was comfortable. Then, as she laid there with her eyes closed waiting for a miracle, the attendants dropped a blade on her neck and cut her head off. Now, before you get all judgy about their methods, you should know that this actually worked. After the head was off, the priest was able to easily reach into the woman's stomach and pull the worm right out. The only problem with that strategy was that they couldn't reattach the head. And sure, you could say that's a big problem, but Asclepius was able to fix everything. After chastising his attendants for taking such drastic measures, he used a salve to heal the connection between the woman's head and stump, and then brought her back to life which had to be a pretty trippy experience for her. In the other myth, a comedy written around the 5th century BCE by Aristophanes, two Athenians take the blind god of wealth named Plutus to a temple of Asclepius to heal his vision. Some important context, Zeus is the one who made Plutus blind so that he distribute wealth without bias. But these two Athenians, who have been poor throughout their lives, want him to spread the wealth evenly across everyone. Now, I'm not here to discuss the economic implications of a decision like that, though we will be revisiting the myth in a month or so to talk about the lesser known deities involved. Today I just want to focus on the process that Plutus went through to be healed by Asclepius because it's indicative of what real ancient Greeks may have experienced. After the patients took a purifying bath in the cold seawater outside the temple at Epidoros, sacrificial cakes and other offerings were laid on a table. Plutus was laid on a couch while his entourage made do with a bed of leaves. That night the priests ordered everyone to go to sleep, but one of the Athenians, Cario, couldn't help but watch them work through a hole in his cloak. He claims to have even seen Asclepius himself moving from patient to patient, making medicine out of the roots and herbs and applying it to wounds. When Asclepius got to Plutus is when his methods got weird though. With the help of his daughters, Yasso and Panakea, whose names translate to healer and cure all, he laid a purple cloth over the god of wealth's face and summoned two serpents which crawled under the cloth and licked his eyes. I'm not exactly sure what was in their saliva, but it was apparently similar to Phoenix Tears because Plutus immediately sat upright, exclaimed that he could see, and Cario, in his excitement, also let out a yelp of joy. This caused basically everyone in the temple to wake up, so at that moment, Asclepius disappeared into the darkness, and the rest of the myth continues on without him. So those are some of the surviving stories that give us a glimpse of the god of medicine's healing process, but I do still have one last tale to tell. The one where he discovers the secret to immortality and invokes the wrath of the gods. In true mythological fashion, there are several different accounts of how Asclepius learned to bring people back to life. Apollodorus claims that he was given Gorgon blood by Athena. He doesn't specify which Gorgon, but the blood that flowed through its left side could destroy people, while the blood from its right side could be used for preservation and resurrection. Our boy I mentioned earlier, Hyginus, has a variant of his own. He said that Asclepius was standing in the house of Glaucus, a patient of his, when a serpent appeared and wrapped itself around his staff. Reflexively, he killed the snake, but then a second snake appeared carrying an herb, and it used it to bring the first snake back to life. So after the god of medicine observed this, he declared that he would put the same herb to use with mankind, 
which you saw in the myth about the lady getting beheaded. Now on the surface, this seems like a fantastic idea, but the gods didn't like him doing it for a number of reasons. According to one version, it's because him bringing people back to life made Hades' job of managing the dead a lot messier and his analytics were taken ahead. In a different variant, it was Zeus who was worried that the rest of humanity would eventually find out the secret for themselves, possibly by watching Asclepius work, and no one would die ever again. Whichever one you want to go with, the end result is the same. On a whim, Zeus strikes Asclepius down with one of his signature thunderbolts, killing him instantly and presumably killing whoever he was resurrecting at that moment for a second time. What a bad deal that guy got. But while Asclepius is dead, his story is not over. After his father Apollo got word that his son was murdered by his own father Zeus, he was furious and wanted revenge, but obviously couldn't do it against the big man himself. So instead, he found a different target for his arrows. In a flash of sunlight that blinded his victim, the god of archery showed up at the forge of Hephaestus and slew the Cyclopes responsible for crafting the thunderbolt that killed his son. Now, if you're thinking that's not exactly fair to the Cyclopes, considering he was just following orders and doing his job, you and Zeus have something in common. He was enraged at Apollo and punished him for his transgression, which you can learn more about in my video on him. But in the end, Apollo still had a good point. A little heads up before you killed my son would have been nice. Tell me, how's it feel to be the worst grandpa ever? So Zeus, feeling a little guilty, brought Asclepius back to life, but not in his mortal form. Because of his undeniable skill and the countless good deeds he performed as a mortal, he was elevated to godhood and became Olympus's official patron of the healing arts. And as if that wasn't enough, Zeus went the extra mile by casting the healer's image in the stars as the constellation Ophiuchus the Snake Bearer, now known as the long lost 13th sign of Western astrology. If you wanna learn more about Ophiuchus, I'll have an episode on it eventually, but as for Asclepius, that was basically everything we know about his messed up mythology. The only thing I didn't touch on are the theories about him being a real man who actually did travel across ancient Greece, saving lives with his medicinal skills and whose good deeds were mythologized by his worshipers. And that's just because I'm not smart enough to communicate all the historical evidence correctly. Personally, I love the theory and wouldn't be mad at all if it were somehow proven true. But now I want to know, what are your thoughts on Asclepius? Has he moved up a few notches on your favorite guy? tier list after this episode? Do you think that he overstepped his authority by resurrecting the dead or was he just fulfilling his destiny as the great healer of mankind? Give me your answers in a comment down below. And after that, maybe rub some ointment on the like and subscribe buttons because they've been taking a beating lately and could really use some love. For those who want to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news or send me suggestions directly, you can follow me on all the social medias by searching John Solo or hitting the links in the description. And if you want to go the extra mile to support the messed up content we make on this channel and join our communal discord, consider supporting our Patreon. Even the $1 level has some pretty sweet benefits. I will see you all again next week when I break down the history, mythology, and folklore of Valentine's Day, or as I like to call it, Singles Awareness Day. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.